So no questions? None? That's okay. We'll get started. So we ended up talking last time pretty much about the tangent problem, which has to deal with how to find the, quote, tangent function or the tangent line uh, to a curve at any point. And I said this was kind of a, a different type of question than you're used to, because usually when you find um, a tangent line or when you time, find the slope of a line, you're using two points. Right? You use that slope formula, which gives you average slope. And for this one, we're, we're actually trying to find the tangent line's slope given just one point. So if I gave you any curve, I said, what is the slope of this line at this point and that point only? That's going to be, like we did last time, the slope of this line, which we call the tangent line. Same word as the trig function, but sort of different meaning here. And it has the slope equal to the curve, but at one point. Okay, so this is quite different than what we're used to. We have to take usually two points. And I said the way that you can estimate this, which is the way that it, it is done, is to use multiple points sampled from your curve and create secant lines. So we create a secant line using two points. And in order to estimate this green line slope, we force these two points to become very, very close together, and I demonstrated that in an Excel spreadsheet at the end. We force these two points to become close together by modifying the x-coordinate by bringing it closer and closer and closer to this point here, and then the secant line slope becomes eventually very, very, very close, arbitrarily close to that green line slope. Okay, and that's generally known as finding generally known as the tangent problem, or finding the slope of the tangent line. This highlights the key idea that in calculus that we're going to use uh, sort of diminishing averages to approximate arbitrarily arbitrarily approximate. That means if you want me to get, uh, you know, if I asked you to arbitrarily estimate the length of this white space, this board in front, uh, that, that means I could give you some precision level, the nearest millimeter, and you could tell me to the nearest millimeter what it is. And then I say, no, the nearest tenth of a millimeter. So you get out another tool and you measure it a little bit closer. And I say, no, the nearest millionth of a millimeter, nanometers, or whatever you want. And you can arbitrarily, to any precision, tell me exactly how long the whiteboard is here. Okay, that's what I mean, arbitrarily approximate. So we're going to use diminishing averages to arbitrate, arbitrarily approximate an instantaneous quantity or rate or change. So I'm going to use a very vague word here, instantaneous thing as we can be approximating lots of things. Areas, slopes, volumes, lots of things. So I'm just going to say thing, because I don't want to write mathematical object. OK? So that's the review of what we did last time. 
Now we're going to apply that to a very specific approximation problem, and it's called the velocity problem. And this is going to be a direct application of finding this tangent thing that we've just viewed and something that we learned about last time. Um, but this has to deal with a, an object's velocity at any point in time. So when you all drive in your car, you all see this nice little thing in front of you. It's got an arrow that sticks out. Uh, it's not the engine gauge, or the, the fuel gauge, sorry, it's the speedometer. I hope I spelled that right. It's not speedometer, is it? It's not speedometer. Well, now it's on the internet forever, so speedometer. <laughs> um, what does this tell you? Does this tell you your car's average speed? Or does this tell you your car's speed at every instant in time? At every instant? Every instant. Yeah. Okay. Now when the police are measuring your speed, they can do this in a couple of ways. Because they can't see this, right? Well, at least Tesla tells us that they can't see it. Um, they can't see this, so we're going to go with that assumption. How can they measure your speed, though? And what are they measuring? Oh, they're taking like an average of how long it takes you to get from point A to point B. Yeah, lots of times there are like markings on roads, or there are signs on roads, and a police officer can pull you over for going from point A to point B in less than a specific amount of time that's well defined. Okay, and speeding tickets are arbitrated by exactly what this distance is and exactly the precision of the timing device used. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a, okay, I'm not going to get into it. So basically they can measure your speed between any two points by taking the distance that they know and dividing by the time that they measure. That's one way they can do it. They can also use the little radar gun, right? Now the radar gun borders on this, but this is average speed. Do you agree? For example, you could stop at point A, wave to the cop, sit there for 10 seconds, drive halfway, stop again, wave again, and then just gun it. Just gun it. And depending on how far you travel and how fast you went, he may or may not be able to pull you over. And the reason is exactly how precise this distance is, how big it is, and how much time it took you. There's, there's, some, uh, there's a lot of mathematics about uncertainties. If this distance is too short, then this time isn't precise enough sometimes for them to get a reliable average. You can, you can adjust averages quite easily. If just one number is crazy big, then the average gets really big too. Anyway. Um, so, average speed compared to instantaneous, I hope you understand the difference, right? You and your car see the instantaneous speed greatly exceeding the speed limit, perhaps. But the police officer oftentimes can only pull you over if your average speed over a certain distance is above the limit. Okay? Now, if they're using radar, sorry. They're not doing this. They're measuring this, and if your instantaneous speed goes over, Sorry, you're at fault. Obey the speed limit, people, okay? Save lives. Your own, primarily. All right, so here's sort of the more difficult problem that we're approaching. So this one's going to be that of the speed of a falling object, so the velocity. So if I took an object, we'll assume it's a spherical object, and I drop it, and it falls some distance, it 
then the distance that object falls and I believe this is a meter is actually a relatively simple function of time. Maybe you remember it back from in uh, physics class. One half of 9.8 times t squared. 9.8 is the acceleration due to gravity at sea level on Earth. So for every second you fall, your speed increases 9.8 meters per second. So it's 9.8 meters per second per second. That's how much your speed increases each second. So Galileo apparently came up with this equation a long time ago. Um, he said that you can drop an object and the distance that the object falls after t seconds which is going to be a value in meters, is equal to 4.9. That's half of gravity's acceleration times the time squared. So now, the velocity problem is just this. What if I asked you, right here, the ball has been dropped from this height, and it has fallen to this level. What's its velocity? How fast is it moving? Okay. Maybe you already know this. Maybe you don't. But it's going to be essentially this problem. Okay? I can almost even keep that exact same graph. What kind of graph do we have for that function? 4.9 t squared. What, what is that? Say it louder. Parabola, very good. So it, it looks like a smiley face, right? Okay, so, so we're working with uh, something like this. We're not going to graph the left side because that means in the past, if we set time zero for when we drop it, then negatives mean in the past. So this is, we're going to assume the graph of 4.9t squared, and I can make that rigorous by saying here's 1, here's 4.9. And now it's precisely the graph. Okay. So, how fast are we when we've been dropped right away? At the very beginning, how fast are we? Zero. Instant you release the object, it's not moving yet. It's accelerating, but it's not moving yet. You agree? Okay. I, if I continue this parabola over and ask you for the slope right there, you would probably give me a tangent line that is horizontal, right? Because the tangent line is negative here in slope, the tangent line is positive over here in slope, which means in between it has to have a slope of zero somewhere. We agree? So that point is right at the cusp of that parabola, right at the vertex. about some arbitrary time later. How are we going to do that? How are we going to find the instantaneous speed? You're smiling over there at the end. I can tell. Right underneath that mask, I can tell. Sorry. How are we going to? No, no. You better be sorry for smiling. Why are you smiling? Do you know how to do this? No. Oh. That's why I'm apologizing. Oh, no, I see. Okay. Apologizing for not knowing. Okay. Okay. So here is an arbitrary point t plotted here. I know exactly the distance fallen at that point. It's 4.9 times t squared. What's the velocity at that time? Do you have any tools in your toolbox, maybe from last lesson, maybe from exactly the beginning of this lesson, that you could use to approximate that? Time sequence lines. Okay. Time sequence lines. 
I mean, like right now in calculus class, this is this is what we have. We don't have fancy functions to do things. We're going to have to create them. So let's take another point. Maybe something just a little bit less, or a little bit more, and then we're going to find the average between them. And like I erased here, we're going to use diminishing things, diminishing averages, to approximate this. And by diminishing, I mean this, this second point is going to get closer to that one, and the secant lines are going to slowly approximate that tangent line. Okay? Do I get to answer that? Oh, no, okay. Shoot. Okay. I told you last time to like become familiar with Excel and, and spreadsheets, right? Okay. So I'll show you precisely what you can do. Let's say find the speed of an object dropped from rest. That means I'm not throwing it down or throwing it up. I'm just holding it and dropping it. Two seconds after it has been released. I'll put an actual number to it. I'm not looking for a function, I'm just looking for um, a number. And the speed of an object drop from the nest two seconds after it's been released. So what I've described over there, what you've all suggested to do is use the slopes of secant lines. So how do we find the slope of the secant line? And, and how can we approximate this? It comes down to using that table. So here, T. Here's the one we're interested in. So what is the value of s of t? How far has it fallen at two seconds? That one we can compute, right? Maybe. What is 2 squared? It's 4. What's 4 times 4.9? Alternatively, what's 4 times 5? 20. 20 now. Remove 4 tenths. 19.5. Very good. All right. So we've found how far it has fallen after two seconds. Can you review that again? Yes. I was just asking. I'm going to make this table. At time t, how far is the ball dropped? I plugged in two here. 4.9 times 2 squared. 2 squared is 4. And then I suggested you use the multiplication trick. This is close to 5, it's one tenth away. Mm -hmm. So multiply by 5, you get 20. Mm -hmm. But we're one tenth away, so remove 4 tenths. Okay. So 19.6 off of, 4 tenths off of 20 is 19.6. Okay, so here's a really bad choice of a secant line. Okay. This is a bad choice because it's going to tell you the slope of this line. That's not close to 2 at all, is it? It's terrible. We're not even going to compute that. Okay. But the average would be this minus this divided by this minus this. So the average velocity would be, I'll make a new column. I'm not even going to compute it. It's this divided by that. Okay. Let's use this you know, getting closer idea. Let's pick something closer. How about like 1.9? That's pretty darn close. Who's got a calculator? Spreadsheet. Gotta make sure 
actually fill this in right. Okay, for each of these computations, what we're going to be doing is finding the average speed, which is just the slope of the line. Where we take this, that's the value at 2, minus the value here. Okay, so this, I'll write it all out. S at 2 minus S at 1.9 divided by 2 minus 1.9. That's the average. This is going to be S of 1.9. And this is just the average slope from this point over to, say, this point. Something like that. Okay, what do we get for those values? What's S of 1.9? Say it louder. 17.6, 7? 17 point something. I can't quite make it up. What do you you got to talk a little louder. 17 point? 6.8. 6, 8. 6 8. thank you. Okay, so that's going to go here. And then to compute that average, we're just computing the slope between this point. Here's x1, y1, x2, y2. We're going to take those differences. So 19.6 minus 17.68 divided by 2. That's the x value for this output, minus 1.9. That's the x value for this input, for that output. Input for that output. And what do we get for that? I'm going to start computing it, just in case nobody else is getting there in time. Okay, I get 19.11. confirm that. I'm about to break Google Sheets. Okay. Plugged in a number so close to two that it just calls it two. And it then gives me the instantaneous speed, which is amazing. You got it? I got 19.2 for the average of 19 point something. I get this on my computer, you get 19.2. Okay, maybe there's something happening there with some decimals. Maybe you've got more decimals here, I'm not sure. Okay, so, ah, that's pretty close. So we might guess that that's actually really close to the actual instantaneous speed at that exact moment. The person or the object with the speedometer on it might actually get something really close to 19.11, 19.2 at that instant in time. But we can get a better approximation, right? And how do we do that? Get closer. When I plug in 1.99 here, I get 19.551. So I evaluate our distance function at this. I get some value here. And then I plug that value in right here, and I plug in 1.99 down there, and the average velocity is 19.551. But then I continue to further in my spreadsheet here. I took three decimals, and it says 19.5951. I have a question. Yeah. So in the example, yeah. um, if we were given this on like a quiz, what input would be the most acceptable for you? Oh, oh, uh, you mean like here? How close should you get? Yeah, how close should we get? Oh, you know, I mean, we're going to learn very quickly tools to 
give the exact value without choosing a number that's really close. Okay. I'm trying to communicate the overall idea in this lesson. Mm -hmm. But, you know, on a spreadsheet, there's no limit to how close you can get. Your calculator only allows so many decimal places. This is what I plugged into Google Sheets. It immediately rounded this to two to show me that, and it says 19.5 repeating. So it did some, some weird things, and it gave me that. So if I had to you know, force you to guess, what is the speed at exactly that time? What would you guess? Would you guess 9.8? No. Would you guess 19.11? This one? No, this one. This one? Okay, so the closer you get, the more sure you are that that's what it is at that exact instant. Because how, you know, that exact instant, how far away are we here? Tens, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, hundred thousands, millions, ten millions, hundred millions, billions, ten, we're like one billionth away from instantaneous velocity. That's pretty much the exact instant. Yes? Why does the speed decrease? For yeah, I'm curious about that too. It's, it has to do, I'm sure, with what Google is doing on that rounding. Uh, that's a computer science problem, not math department. <laughs> you can push that on that. Okay, so this this is this is the idea behind calculus that we're just going to get arbitrarily close to something. We're going to have diminishing things that get, as you can see, closer and closer, maybe to like an exact value. So here we have yes, nineteen. if we trust the computer scientists. So, I believe that's the end of section 2.1. That's the velocity problem. No problem. It's just the problem of recording this with the camera. into sort of rigorous mathematical terms what a limit is. A limit is essentially what we were just doing. We were approaching something, getting really, really close to it. We were taking a limit, some sort of process which goes to infinity. So here we go. We're going to consider this function. x minus 1 divided by x squared minus 1. As x gets closer and closer and closer to, so I'll make it narrow, minus 1 divided by x squared minus 1. What happens at 1? That's my first question. What happens to this function at 1? It's undefined. It's undefined. Technically, it's undefined. We can't plug in 1 here because we have the division by 0. Some of you might be screaming at that, because what would you like it to do at 1? I mean, you'd love it if it was just 1 half, right? <laughs> right? I mean, a half is like the perfect number. 
because you, you simplify this down, x minus 1 over x minus 1 times x plus 1 cancels. So when you plug in 1, you get You'd love it if it was just that. Right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, that was great. Too bad. It's not fine that way. That's the simplification of it. The original function does not have 1 in its domain. This new thing that we found by simplifying is a different function altogether. It is. If I were to graph it, there would be this little spot where you cannot tell me what the function's value is, but you can tell me the good guess. So this brings us to the idea of a limit. limit. A limit is a value, often. A limit is a value. When you get further along in calculus, a limit can be a function. Uh, you can have things like limiting uh, functions. But for now, a function is going to be a value that a function Approaches. Okay, so there's some, some terms in here. A limit is a value that a function approaches. So let's consider this. The same function that we have. function in, like in two tables, double table here. Pick some numbers that are less than one, pick some numbers that are just bigger than one, but we're going to try and pick numbers that eventually get closer to one. Some of them are bigger, so they're approaching from the right side of the x-axis. Some are smaller, so they're approaching from the left side of the axis. And we're just evaluating our function at those numbers. So this is going to be for this, this is going to be for this make sense so far on the table? Yeah. Okay. So if we plug in like 0.5, that's smaller than 1. The function gives us 2 thirds. If we plug in 0.9, the function gives us a decimal that is 0.526316. So we're just plugging these values, 0.5, in here. So 0.5 gives us negative 1 half, dividing by 1 fourth minus 1, that's 3 fourths. So we get 1, negative 1 half, divided by uh, 3 fourth, negative 3 fourths, which cancels out the negatives. The 4 cancels out with the 2 up top, and the 3 folds around at the bottom, so we get two-thirds. Okay, so you can work that out if you like, but that's what it ends up as. 0 0.9, that, that's just the number you get. You can plug in 0 0.9 here, 0 0.9 here, figure it out with your, with your computer or calculator. You get this value. Let me keep filling this in, just to sort of highlight this limit idea with this. If you keep going from the left, you get 0 0.502513 for the next one. If you go to 0.999, you get 0 0.500250. We approach from the left, and goodness gracious, doesn't this seem to make us think we get to one half? Oh, that looks good, doesn't it? But I have this question now. Is it the same from the right? What we're doing now is something that's called a left limit, a left-hand limit. We're choosing inputs that are smaller from the left, that are smaller than the one we want. This is left hand limit. It looks like it's approaching one half. What about the right hand limit, approaching from the right? If you plug in 1.5, you get 0 0.40000. Okay. You plug in 1.1, 1.01, 1.001, the values you get are 
0.497190.497512. And the last one that I'll give here is 0.499. 750. And this really is a great example of looking at a left hand limit, approaching a specific unallowed value from the left. And this sequence of numbers gets really, really close to this, which you all, well, at least I hoped it would equal. Similarly, if we approach from the right, we take numbers bigger than this value, the unallowed value, we plug them in, and the sequence of numbers gets closer and closer and closer to our. You know, the value that we hoped for, right? Okay. That value one half is what we call the limit. Because if we continue to refine this, you know, point nine 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 nine, this would actually get closer to one half. If we refine this, one point zero 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 one, this would get closer to one half. If we kept refining and did this indefinitely, we would just keep getting numbers that get closer and closer and closer to this. This is what I mean by approaching up here in this definition. The limit is the value. Sorry. No problem. The value that the function approaches. Okay? So this one half, the value that the function seems to be approaching is the limit. To write this down, we use this symbol. X. Sorry. No problem. I need to put like tape marks so that I know exactly where to put these legs. That's good as well. The exact notation is this. You write these three letters, L, I, M. This represents the limit. Underneath it, you write an arrow. To the right of that arrow, you write the number that your approximations are going to. So we could not plug in one over here. That's where we were curious what the function looks like. So we're going to be getting closer and closer to this unallowed value. Uh, called the input in question. And to the left of the arrow, we write what we're going to be, what's going to be approaching that. For us, x was approaching that. We approached it from the left here, we approached it from the right here. x was the variable that was approaching it. Uh, later on, maybe you'll see things like functions approaching specific values. So you can use this notation to represent even more complicated things. For now, we're just going to use the basic uh, variable. And then to the right of this, you write the function itself. So here this is the thing that it's close to. Uh, this. And then you write the function. So for us, x minus 1 over x squared minus 1. And according to this table, the limit's 1 half. So this one half is the limit. Okay. So my question to you, my next one is, does a limit always exist? Does a limit always exist? If I give you some function, I give you some input, I say what happens at this input, does the limit at that always exist or not? Um, so now think about how we arrived at this one half. We approximated from the left, we approximated from the right. Were they the same number? Yes. If that happens, you're good. The limit exists but it's entirely possible that they're not the same. Okay, let me make sure I'm not skipping way ahead. 
Yeah, I have a question. I am, so I'm going to walk myself back and answer this question. Yes. Uh, if, so I'm not understanding the limit, because if you were to, like, is it saying that if you were to input a half into a relax, you would get one? Is that correct? No, that's not what it's saying. Okay, so I'm confused on that concept then. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. Let me, let me, um, let me give a different example, but something that I can easily grab. Okay? All right, so we'll work with a line. Okay, so simple graph. We know that everything, every x, you know, we can plug in and we can compute the value. So maybe I'll do this. I'll make it piecewise. So for any x that's not equal to 0, this is our rule. But when x is 0, the rule is going to be this, 10. So here's, here's our graph. 3x plus 1 goes through this point 1, and then it goes up 1, 2, 3 for every 1 going over. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, here. So our graph kind of looks like this sloped line, except when x is 0. When we plug in 0, we can't actually get this point. We don't get this exact value. Okay? We get instead, when x is 0, 10. Okay, so I've graphed this. This is exactly what it looks like. It's 3x plus 10 everywhere except when we plug in 0. We don't put it here. We put it at this rule, which is a 10. Okay. So I've already said that this hole is at a coordinate 0, 1. If we plug in 0 here, we okay. So now my question, we could do it using this table sort of thing, but I think graphically this makes a lot of sense. Here's my target value, 0. So 0 would be here and here. We're going to pick numbers that are less than 0 and numbers that are greater than 0. We're going to plug them into our function. We're going to find the limit. Mm -hmm. Essentially what that means is what's the height as you trace this curve from the left and what's the height as you trace the curve from the right and get closer and closer to that point in question. So you answer me, what's the limit of limit as x goes to 0 of our function y? One. One. What do you get when you plug in 0? Mm -hmm. hmm? You get 1. No. What's the rule say? All the time. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So limits have to deal with approaching, not what it actually is there. In fact, it may not even be defined here. I may not even have a rule for what happens. There's a lot of functions that you know where there's no rule for what happens at a value. Consider just 1 divided by x. What's at 0? It's undefined at 0, right? That, that function is entirely more broken than this one is. This one's still defined as 0. It's defined as 10. But the limit is actually 1. The limit for 1 over x is even worse. It's two different values. One is positive infinity, one is negative infinity. Mm -hmm. Which means, OK, OK, here we go. So OK, so I think that's good. That's a good example. Other questions? Otherwise, I'm going to erase some of this stuff here. Questions? That's a really good question. Okay? Really good question. Thanks for asking. Okay, I'm going to erase the table here. Part of what we need to do here is just learn the language. Um, like what to say, how to read these types of things. So I'll use this example. I wrote this. That 
can you state it in words? So in English words, that is written as the limit as x approaches 0 is 1. want to be more explicit about what, the limit of what, you would just add that right here, of y. The limit of y as x approaches 0 is 1. Okay, so in general, just without anything, if I have this limit x going to a, some function equals capital L. This would be in words, tell your neighbor. Use this as a model for what this would be said or how that would be spoken in words. Tell your neighbor. Um, so I, the so many times. That's great. So it's just the limit of f of x as x approaches a is l. Okay. Good. So, you know, you'll see this an awful lot. This is just how you say it, okay? Okay, so I've graph something sort of silly. We'll say this is a graph of f of x. We'll say this is negative 5, this is 1, and this is, I don't know, 10. There we go. So here's, here's a few questions for you. The limit as x approaches negative 5 of f is the limit as x approaches uh, 1 of f is, and then I'm not going to ask you to tend. We're going to erase this part. Who cares? There. These are the two I care about. So I, I told you about how to do a graphic loop before. This is just a, a quick recap. What is the answer to the second one? We'll do that one first. So we look at the function here at this point, 1. And we consider values of x just bigger, and we consider values of x just smaller, and we let these get closer and closer and closer to 1, and we look at what happens to the height of this function as we go from the left and from the right. They all agree at this height, I didn't even give it a value, there. What is the limit as x goes to 1 of our function? It's Negative one. Very good. Follow-up question: What is f of one? Five. Are those the same? No. Do they need to be? No. Not at all. Okay. Um, I'll put a couple more values here. This is obviously seven, and this is obviously two. What's this one? The limit as we approach negative five. Seven. Okay. 
Now we need to introduce more language. Before the limits from the left and the limits from the right agreed. Now they don't. Uh, I call them and limits left and right because that's you can you, you might see it's uh, written side or left side. So these are just written a little bit differently, and I'll use this as the example. When you want to indicate which side you're approaching from, and that's important, as in, as in this example, you indicate which side you're approaching from with a little superscripted negative sign or positive sign. If you're approaching from values a little bit less so from like this left hand side, you indicate that with a negative sign superscripted on the value. Okay, it just says the limit as x goes to negative 5 from the left, from the negative side of things. Because remember, we're modifying the x value, so we're modifying things a little bit less. That's on the more negative side, right? Okay. What would you guess for here? The limit as x goes to negative 5, superscripted plus. That means we're picking x is a little bit bigger than 5 on the positive side of things. And we're coming this way. So this is the limit as x goes to negative 5 from the right of our function. Now we can nicely say this, right? We didn't know if it was 2 or 7 before. It turns out they go here. From the left, what's our limit? Two. We trace our graph from the left of that value we're approaching, and we arrive at a height of 2. So that's the left-hand limit. We trace our graph from the right. We approach x equal to negative 5 from the right. And what's our limit? Our right hand. Seven. Very good. We can talk about limits from the left, limits from the right, or just a limit in general. But there's one rule to determine if a limit. Yeah, perfect timing. Well, this is a good punchline. There's one rule to determine if a limit actually exists. So in this case, it was proper to say that the limit is in fact negative 1. But in this case, it is not proper to say that the limit is one of these two. They're different numbers. Right? So we're going to say the limit as x goes to a of a function is L if and only if the left-hand limit equals an L, and the right-hand limit is also L. Okay? So there's two things you can be sure of. If you see this written down and it's a true statement, then you know both the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit agree at that value. So here we said the limit was negative 1 here. That means the right-hand limit and the left-hand limit were a value of 1. They agreed. That's the first thing you can know from this statement. The second thing is, if you see that the left-hand limit is equal to the right-hand limit, then for sure you can just say this is true. Okay? If and only if means this implies this, and conversely, this implies that. Okay. So this is a tool for determining limits, actually. How do you find the limit of any function at a value? I made a table of values earlier and demonstrated it. How do you determine this? You calculate this, and then you calculate this, and if they're the same, 
you know the limit. If they're not the same, what do you say? Does not exist. Because those two limits are not the same. The left and right are different. So the limit is not something that we can talk about. Okay? All right. Well, thank you for coming today. I'll see you next time.